These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> Today's episode of The Other Stories is The Bombsy Tit, written and narrated by Luke Condor. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. That's what Mum said, and that's what I said that she said when I accidentally spilled some on the bathroom tiles. It was Colgate, strawberry mint flavour. I say accidentally, but I did it on purpose, and I did it because Dot likes it. Well, she used to like it. She used to like all sorts of stuff that fell on the floor. Sandwich crusts, sausages, Cheerios, and, like I said, toothpaste. Sometimes I'd let her lick the minty foam directly from the toothbrush, and the freshness would make her teeth jitter. May as well let her have it, I told my mum when she caught us. After all, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Mum tried not to care, but she was already reaching for the cleaning spray. It was only toothpaste, only a bathroom tile, she said. I think maybe she tried not to care, mostly because Dad would have. Dad would have cared and done some. He would have cared so much he would have gotten loud, loud enough to knock the lamps and the family photos from the sides. I'd seen him do that before, which is, come to think of it, the day before I never saw him again. Mum and Dad's argument started small. It was something about somebody not picking up salt from the corner shop on the way home. These kinds of arguments are never about what they're actually about. I don't think my dad even liked salt all that much. They sent me to bed and I sat by the bedroom door, listened to the rage as it spilled out and soaked into the walls. Still, they sent me to bed and I sat by the bedroom door, listened to the rage as it spilled out and soaked into the walls, into the floors, drained like bath water from here to somewhere else. Dot hid under the bed like she always did. She whined like my bite breaks used to when I didn't oil them. In the shadows, her eyes were wet and sore. It looked like she'd been crying, like she understood what was happening downstairs, maybe more so than I did. The next time I went downstairs, my dad was gone. He's playing hide and seek, my mum said, lied. Still, when she wasn't around, I called out to him. Daddy, I'd sing, creeping from room to room. Where are you? I'd do it just like we used to. I'd jump around every corner, occasionally snap my head around as if to catch him behind me, peeking out from behind the curtains or from inside the TV cabinet. I never did find him. I never found lots of stuff, though. I believe now that there are vanishing spots, beneath sofa cushions, under car seats, and I think this house is full of them, the places where things go missing. Money, keys, memories, people. I think that's where Dad went to the land of car keys, pencils, and TV remotes, the hide-and-seek place. So, Dot licked the toothpaste from the bathroom tile, her teeth chittering as Mum wrapped her hand in kitchen paper and suggested I take Dot for a walk. I already did, I said, even though I hadn't. Then, do some puppy training or something, she said. Oh, Mum, please. Fine. It's important for me to picture Dot as she was back then because the more time that passes, the less steady that picture becomes, like the ink in my mind never set, and with every passing second, the colours run, the outlines blur, so I scrunch up my brow and I focus until it hurts. Dot was a sausage dog. She was the colour of mud. She had foamy lips and gooey bits in her eyes and left trails of fur and waxy dander on everything she touched. She was smart as anything. When he asked her to sit, she did. When he asked for her paw, she gave it and also sometimes when I didn't ask for it. Her best trick was that she would go through this fabric tunnel we used to have. She'd do it on command, but only if I went to meet her at the other side, and usually only if I had a treat waiting for her. If I didn't, then she'd make it to the halfway point and stay there and hide. On that last day, I was trying to teach her to lie down. Mum watched us through the window. She even smiled when Dot fell onto her side and I rubbed her belly. But then when I looked up again, she was gone. Back to her cleaning, I guess. She was always cleaning. I think Dad must have really made a mess when he disappeared because even when it was clean, it was still messy. It was like a bombsy tit, he might have said. Well, what he actually would have said was, it looks like a bombs hit it. I only realised years later that I'd been saying it wrong. I'd always thought he was calling it a bombsy tit, 
like it was some kind of animal. Not quite a blue tit, but a bumsy tit. I don't know where the expression came from. If I ever find him, I'll be sure to ask. It was cold that day. The leaves were dead. The skies were crispy and gold, glowing and magic. The air smelled like spent fireworks. Poor, I said. Doc gave it. Sit, I said. She sat. Who's the good girl, I said. She was. I was supposed to give her a single treat for a single trick, but I gave her a handful each time. The quicker they were gone, the sooner I could go back inside and play PlayStation. Tunnel, I said, pointing Dot towards the fabric tunnel in the middle of the garden. It was blue and dirty and ribbed, and when you were finished with it, you could squeeze it together like a long accordion. Sometimes I like to squeeze it shut, throw it into the air and watch it spring open. Come on, Dot, tunnel. She wagged her tail, then gave me her paw again. No, Dot, not quite. I took her by the collar to the edge of the tunnel and together we peered through. We could see all the way through, see the dead tree at the other side of the garden and the moss-covered shed behind it. Bloody hell, I said, doing an impression of my dad. Looks like a bumsy tit. Dot grumbled. I threw a treat inside. Go on then, go on through, Dot. Still, she didn't want to. I had to push her by the butt and smush her face into the entrance. Good girl, I said, still squeezing her in. Keep going, good girl. Her shadow scrunched along the thin fabric. Then, as she often did, she stopped at the halfway point. Dropping the last treat from the packet into my hand, I went to step towards the tunnel's exit. I heard feet rustling through the leaves behind me. I spun and for a second I could have sworn that I saw my dad, but it was just the breeze moving through the bushes and the shadows moving in the gaps in the garden fence. Mum had told me again and again that Dad wasn't coming home, but I couldn't help it. I could feel him, not quite here, but still very much nearby. Here, Dot, I said, calling down to the exit of the tunnel. We haven't got all day. The golden glow in the skies had started to dim. The street lights looming over the fence threatened to flicker, and the coldness wormed into my bones. Come on, Dot. I dropped to my knee and held the treat out by the exit. Got something for you. I kept my eyes on the short space between my hand and the last ring of the tunnel. A breeze fluttered out from within and with it the smell of aging meat. Suddenly terrified, I yanked back my hand and looked at the middle of the tunnel. The shadow was gone and there were no bumps or curves outlining Dot's frame. Dot, I said. I had the feeling of fingers walking along the inside of my stomach. I leant down, peeped back through the tunnel. It was empty. I stood scanned the garden, then checked behind the tree, the shed, up the side path, but Dot was gone. The thought of losing her boiled the cold from my bones as I raced around the garden, calling her name over and over, and only after realising she truly wasn't in the garden, I told my mum. Years later, I still think about that face mum made when I told her, where it might have been later that night, after the hours of searching, asking neighbours, shouting Dot's name until our throats felt like they were splintering, I suppose it doesn't matter when it was that Mum made that face because in my head, she never stopped. Days without Dot became weeks, became months, became years. But as with my dad, I couldn't allow myself to believe that she was truly gone. They were only playing. They were in the hide-and-seek place. Mum caught me one time calling Dot's name from the back door and she hit me. I was shocked at first, but then I walked out into the garden and checked the fabric tunnel one more time. Then I collapsed it down and put it away in the shed. In dreams, I'd sometimes lean over the side of my bed and look beneath to see wet and sore eyes staring back at me. Not Dot's, but my father's. I'd hear myself singing, Daddy, where are you? And he'd belly crawl towards me with lengthening arms and a stretching forehead, everything about him dripping like caramel, his front teeth sticking to the carpet, and I'd wake up just before his fingers touched my face. That house was a nice house. It was built for a large family and yet my mum stayed there, alone, for going on 30 years. After I married and had kids of my own, I took them over every other weekend just to try and get some life into those dead walls, maybe add a little warmth. Though I have to admit I never let them out of my sight when they were there. At least I got to say goodbye to my mum. After she died, it took me almost a week to clear out the house to choose between the memories to take home 
to put into storage or to throw into the rusty skip out front. We didn't leave much but for the holes in the walls where nails used to be and a stain on the bathroom floor that never did come out. On the day I was due to pass the keys to the estate agent, I took one last look around and found the fabric tunnel tucked behind the garden shed. We'd been through the house and even the garden several times, so I don't know how we missed it, but there it was, covered in dead greenery and dirt, still collapsed, squeezed shut, and locked with a Velcro tie. I dragged it out and placed it in the middle of the garden. I unfastened the tie. Instead of springing open, it slowly stretched out like some giant fabric earthworm. I positioned the tunnel exactly as I remembered it being, and I stood above the exit. Leaves rustled behind me, but this time I did not turn away. When I look away, things have a habit of disappearing out of my view, out of my life. I sometimes think that if I'd not gone to bed that night, if I'd not taken my eyes off of my dad, he'd still be here. But I did, and he slipped into the place between, beneath or above to be with the hidden things and dots I'm here now standing at the tunnel in the garden in the middle I see something an outline of something pushing against the fabric there are shadows where there were none moments ago I feel sick my blood thumps in my ears and my head feels so heavy and what is that smell dog breath or aging meat stomach acid or roadkill I drop to my knees it used to be that I'd have to hold a treat for her to come out, but this time I have none. I offer only my hand and hold it by the exit. Then I hear movement from inside, slow and wet, sticky and messy. Here, girl, I say. My hand shakes, but I don't move away. How she must feel, trapped in the hidden place that's not quite here, and what might become of her, squashed and stretched inside the tunnel, accordioned. The air around the exit shivers. Thick, warm breath tickles the hairs on my fingers. There's a bike brake whine in need of oil. Here, I say again, and my breath leaves me when the first part of her emerges. I piss myself, I think. Good girl, I say, through my closed mouth, through salt and snot. She's a mess, an untidy vision. Parts exposed it shouldn't be a twisting tongue and glistening pockets of ooze. Bloody hell, I think. She looks like a bumsy tit. I found you, I say. Wet and sore eyes stare at mine with desperate sorrow as brittle teeth pierce the meat of my palm, and my blood darkens the grass as she takes a treat. I want to pull away, but I couldn't now if I tried. It's too late. I know that. Dot is halfway out, is returning, and with chittering teeth she eats. More of her exits the tunnel and it won't stop. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, I think. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. I see things appearing in the grass and flower beds. Keys, remote controls, jewellery, headphones, rising from the ground like bizarre flowers. The sun darkens and I hear someone standing behind me. A hand plants on my shoulder. I turn my head and say, Oh, Dad. There you are. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories, The Bombsy Tit, was written and narrated by Luke Condor, edited by Duncan Muggleton with music by Duncan Muggleton and Tom Robson, and sound effects provided by freesound.org. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spoon of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community managers, Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and to Joshua Boucher and Karen O'Brien for helping with our submission reading, and of course to Ben Errington for digging deep and excavating fossilised content DNA of which he will make dinosaurs. I haven't quite figured that one out, but it... Luke Condor started writing on his computer in his early teens and never looked back. And now he has very sore eyes. He runs and produces this podcast, The Other Stories. Um, he also won the Best Low Budget Film Award at the London Shore Film Festival. And he works from a dining room table in the middle of Sherwood Forest and lives with his fiance, Cat, their pet cat, Oscar, and their larger, angrier cat, Alaska who's actually a dog. Find out more at www.lukecondor.com and that's Condor spelt with a K. The Other Stories is a production of the Story Studio Hawk and Cleaver and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, no commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means share the hell out of it. So, until next time. <laughs>